everyone, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast, the first podcast in quite a while. I think it's been since June last year. I'm sorry it's been so long, but a patron of mine, Tom Blackburn, gave me this really cool idea, and I wanted to try it out. He gave me this idea where he was listening to episode 5, and he was he said, hey, I think it would be better for you to have guests on with that. I have my first ever, I don't want to say first ever guest, because I've had guests on, but my first guest of the new year, Ann Stucci, is that how I pronounce it? Yeah, it's quite Stucci, like, it, Stucci. it's Italian, yeah. Okay, and then we're going to be talking about Monday today, uh, which is the newest film from Pablo Lorraine. I've seen his movies, Spencer, Jackie, um, unfortunately I do not have a reference point for every, anything else, so... It might influence some of our discussion, but Anne, tell me, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and talking about this weird film. Yeah, I'm a filmmaker myself. I just graduated from school, from Full Sail University. Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually doing shorts right now, even though I just directed my first play here in Lima, Peru. And yeah, the only thing that I'm going, that I'm like trying to plug in is my short film, Unlovers, is just uh, currently in the world circuit, like festival circuit, sorry. But I'm probably going to upload it soon in YouTube, probably in mid-October. So yeah, that's it. Nice. What festivals are you going to for that? Right now, I'm in a Liftoff Network Festival. The other one is one here in Lima. Actually, the the day after tomorrow is the award ceremony, so I'm going to know if if I win or <laughs> anything. Yeah, hope, yeah. We're still like figuring out another festivals to just uh, send the film to, and another that we have already sent it, but are waiting for the, an answer. Yeah. Nice. I hope people see it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I guess that takes us to the weirdest discussion that I think we'll, I'll have all week. I'm talking, I, I mentioned before we started, but I'm recording a Cocaine Bear podcast, which may end up being weirder, with Emmanuel on a Tuesday and then Elemental on Monday with Sebastian Zavala, who I, I don't know, work with. I don't know how you call being in a critics group together working, but but yeah, this is going to be very weird. For those who don't know, El Conde is, it is a Spanish language film from Pablo Lorraine. As I mentioned before, you may have noticed his work from Spencer or Jackie. And it basically is this, I want to call it a what-if scenario for this, for if Augusto Pinochet had... Mm lived for 250 years as a vampire that's the basic premise of this yeah and it's very weird so i think first and foremost and i i think this is going to be where i start with these discussions is i'm always interested to know did you have you seen any trailers for this before watching it Mm, same as you, as we uh, mentioned before, I am not like very familiar, but I'm familiar with the director's work. Spencer, Jackie, no, the, the one he directed last in Chile be- before this one. Um, and one other one that I'm forgetting that is a biopic as well. But never mind. I saw that the he was directed this film and I'm like, Okay, yeah, and I think I'm gonna watch the trailer because I'm very cautious when it comes to trailer. I don't want to be, get spoiled. Like it, it's pretty much after I saw the film that I watched the trailers or I watched the reviews. So I went completely blind just seeing one trailer that has basically the premise, mm-hmm. and that's it. I so I cheated myself. I. Okay. <laughs> I watched the trailer right before seeing the movie. Oh, wow. The trailer that's on Netflix. I don't know if it was Mm -hmm. the first trailer or second trailer. It was really short, but I was like, so what exactly is this movie? Because the 
Netflix description is not doing anything for me. But yeah, it, it was interesting. And I think Lorraine has, I, I would say he has an interest in biopics of mm-hmm. the sort, or at least political leaders. Because yeah, it, it, it's interesting. But yeah, yeah. I, and I think the trailer kind of sells you a different movie, which is interesting. But yeah, with that, I think, what, what did you expect out of this? Yeah, sorry. Watching Pablo's Larraín's work before, I was expecting something. That, because it's weird. It's true what you're saying. Because the trailer sets you up in a satire, but a complete satire. And some sort of horror elements, but not quite as the film really does. So I was I was expecting something like in the not in the genre but in the comedic tone of say Knives Out or something like that. Um, Ooh, that that that's probably a really good comparison because one of the mm-hmm. lines I got hooked on in the trade it's at the very end of the where they talk to each other and this one guy proposes a plan and he's like, so what you want to kill four vampires. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And with the kids are especially yeah. the ones that remind me of Knives Out or something like that. But yeah, I was expecting something in that comedic like territory. But at the end, I, I received something like... But I should have known because Pablo Larraín's work is very muted. It's very like nuanced, it's very aesthetic, very atmospheric, which the trailer sets you up not exactly in that realm you know in the photography it's black and white and <clears throat> sorry and it's going to be like atmospheric at that level that it's a black and white film but that's it that the trailer basically set you up for a comedy type film yeah yeah <laughs> and I, I think i'd agree with that assessment because it's it even the um description off Netflix or wherever you uh, get your descriptions from really does, I think even the poster says a black comedy satire or something mm-hmm. like that and you're waiting and waiting and then when it finally does come you're like, oh, this is the movie I've been waiting for mm-hmm. for like an hour <laughs> yeah, uh, but we have to wait that is, that is yeah, the thing it, yeah, and yeah, and I think that's in essence, I think my overall thoughts on the film is just it makes you wait so long mm-hmm. that by the time you get there, you're like, finally, we got to the thing we had been promised in, in on that poster or in that description. And I think it might wait too long to get to that point. Yeah, for me, I think it was easier because I <clears throat> I know that we have to wait like at least an hour, fifteen minutes, to get into the right juicy there. part, into yeah, into the satire part of it. But throughout the film, especially at the beginning or when they're introducing the whole thing, uh, and one other thing, when you describe the film as a Spanish uh, speaking film, I was like, it is a Spanish speaking film, but it's it has a lot of different languages in it, which is it does. Yeah, throughout the film, like I was saying, I, as a fellow Latin American, I got a lot of references or a lot of lines that I'm like, okay, that's funny. Because we have a lot of sense of humor about how bad we are seen. There's a very famous film here in Peru called No Se Lo Digas A Nadie or Don't Tell Anybody, which is very satiric. It is about a man in the 80s, like trying to experience his queerness, but in a very macho way. And there's this very famous line, one of the most famous lines in film, in Peruvian film history, which says, you can be a rapist, you can be a thief, you can be even a murderer, but you cannot be a faggot. (laughs) And it's, Really, it's it's awful. But that is basically the like the resume of what being 
Latin American or is we know we're shit. We know we we are behaving badly, but we're not that bad. Like in the movie when the El Conde is talking to the his butler, and his butler is saying like, "I may be a murderer, but you're a thief." And the Conde says, "No, I like killing too." <laughs> yeah, it's like that. So throughout the film, I got these like lines that I was like, "Okay, that's funny." Okay, that I get that, but yeah, the the satire part of, or the entire premise and the craziness of it all, it comes very late into the film. Yeah, there is one line which I don't want to say what it is for mm-hmm. fear of spoiling the movie for others. But there was one movie where I wrote down one line where I wrote down in my notes. Oh, I get it. I've heard this line a thousand times, but it's even funnier now. Mm-hmm. Uh, all I'll say is it's clue esque in its theater. yeah um, yeah that that's as close as I'll get without spoiling it. But going back a little bit, this has roots in history. Augusto Pinochet is a what if scenario, and it talks about the 1973 coup, and it talks about at the same time it talks about the I I don't know what the word or phrase of it would be. But it talks about how power is recognized throughout hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh yeah. And I just want—I just, want, I just wanted to talk about that for a little bit. What did you think about that section where it actually does go into that history of, hey, who's little? Here's the cliff notes on who Augusto Pinochet was. Personally, it was a lot for me um, because I was like, I don't know who this person is. So I'm learning a lot right now. Yeah. But what did you think? Yeah, at school, I think when I was like probably 11 or 12, they taught me how the history of it all of Chile, because it's so close to my country. But I wasn't familiar with the whole gist of it. I I, I knew, I don't know, 20, 30 percent of the reality. I would actually say that this film requires a little bit of homework like you need to know okay, at least to know yeah at least who the man was and what he did because this is a monster movie like I, i've been hearing a lot that adapting the life of a monster he decided to create pa- paulo larain decided to do a monster film which i get and it's great but uh, the especially the first 20 minutes when they're like doing a like a zooming up of his life is really like with the fantastical elements of everything yeah. like it's a lot especially when because i knew two days before but i was reading the wikipedia of pinochet and i realized oh yeah no i read it because la rain won at venice film festival best screenplay mm-hmm. and he said at the end of the speech, no impunidad, which means, I don't know what is the exact word in English, but no impunity, I want to say, that because basically the man died in real life without even giving a punishment. He didn't, was judged by a Chilean jurisdiction. He simply just died. And all of his victims and all of his crimes, they're gone, basically. So I was like, okay, now I think I'm getting it. But I was very slow. <laughs> it was very slow for me. It was a slow process we're, we're watching the film. Because it gives you no like heads up or for, okay, this is the man we're going to talk about and we're going to explain it throughout. No, they, they give you the information like, okay, this is it. And now we're moving on onto the... <laughs> the crazy part yeah and it's just and it's not to be clear we're not talking about a you know a little montage where here's five minutes and then now you're into the movie we're mm-hmm. talking about 30 45 mm-hmm. minutes and yeah or, or something like that and then you're in into the actual movie and you're just like wait hold on i need some time to decompress i what <laughs> yeah because it's just such thrown at you that you're I, I almost feel like the rest of the movie is the come down of, mm-hmm. of where you're like, OK, now I can relax. Oh, wait, now it's turning into something even more 
stressful and I, I don't know it just felt it just felt like maybe Lorraine was trying to fit too much or or maybe it's just did you watch Chevalier? I did not not, not yet. So th- that movie suffers a, the same problem where it's oh yeah everyone knew, knew who Chevalier is when in reality even the bonus features uh were like yeah nobody knew who, th- who this was because he was lost to history. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a bit of that element where I'm like am I supposed to know who this person was? Yeah. So that was just the thing for me where I was like, oop, I technical difficulties. I pulled them out. <laughs> That's okay. You okay? Yeah, I pulled out my headphones. I sat oh, okay. on the cable. But yeah, it just was a, a shock to the system in a way mm-hmm. because it was like so much all at once. But yeah, I think once you get into the satire part of it, it's it, it, it gets into its rhythm. Yeah, except I would say the last 20 minutes that without spoiling anything. What would what did you think about the narrator? I I hated it. I hated it. I was like, okay, I get it. You're trying to be cutesy, you're trying to be like, oh hey, this is almost like a biopic narrator. But as time goes on, it got even more annoying. Especially I want to say, is it the middle of the film where it starts to like interject? Yeah. Where, where the narrator starts to interject. And I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to watch one movie over here. And now you're putting two other movies into that. I feel like almost suffers from bloat in those areas where yeah. I know it's trying to do a, a thing for the story. But also I'm like, I can't. My ADHD brain can't keep track of these two conversations happening at once. Yeah, no, it's a lot. It, and as you say, it suffers from being too much. Like if it was like a three hour film when they have time to explain everything and the structure of it all, it goes into what filmmaking is, which is go ups and downs and everything. This is, you start from here from the get-go you start very high and it cools down for a bit but then it goes wild again and especially with the narrator stuff but yeah what what i would say it has in his favor is that one review that i watched it a a man uh a spanish guy who knew everything about the pinochet history he went to venice uh, to see the screening of the film and he completely got it. It was just like one of his favorite films. And and I was watching that review and he said something that really stuck with me that he said that Pablo Larraín worked before in all his biopics, like Spencer, Jackie, and the other one that I'm forgetting the name right now. I apologize. No uh, he's very sympathetic with the subject. Like he's very, even though we love uh, lady, lady Die, or not everyone loves like Jackie Kennedy, but respect that aspect of her life. Uh, Neruda, I'm sorry, yeah, Neruda, uh, yeah, Neruda was the the other one, and everyone likes Pablo Neruda, uh, especially for his work. Nobody likes Pinochet, and especially Pablo Larraín with this film. He does something very different, and that was uh, the phrase that the other one, the other critic said that stuck with me, that he hates Pablo Reigns, hates Pinochet so much that he has exercised that hatred into a two-hour film. That basically, if Augusto was alive, if Pinochet was alive, his family certainly is, they will watch this. And they would completely hated it because they, he, they called him a thief, which he hated the most because he was general. And he was like, no, OK, yeah, I'm a murderer, but I'm not a thief. Um, the film goes very straight and saying that he was a complete thief. Yeah. That he did. And by the end, that I don't want to spoil the film, what the end phrase was, 
he was a complete moron towards women, especially women. So he would completely hate that ending. Yeah. Yeah, that I had a note, which would be a spoiler, but uh, I, I said something along the lines of Twilight had a better version of this. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's like when I first saw Roma back in 2018, I knew that it was going to be a hard watch. Another black and white Netflix film. I dig it. I did. But no, it, it, back in Roma. But I liked it better when I did my research afterwards. And I think with this film, it's similar because afterwards I, I've done like my research. I've been watching reviews, especially preparing for this one. I was watching all the, of this backstory on what the director wanted to say. Why is he making this film? Why he did what he did in the film itself? And with that in mind, I would give it more credit, but it's not like I would watch it again soon. Like it's not entertaining per se. It's like entertaining for a bit, but then it's, you have to know all of this homework to actually get it, which I don't think works in the film favor. No, I don't think it does either. I was talking with some of my International Film Society critics people, and we have a WhatsApp chat, and okay. I was telling people I was watching it, and I was like, this is not vibing with me at all. And one of our critics liked it, and I said, if I have to watch this a second time, I'm not. I'm just going to skip ahead to an hour in and then watch the rest of the movie. The only thing... For me, I will watch it again. I have a an uncle who hates film. He only watches comedies, Sam Sandler comedies, and K-dramas from Korea. He hates film. And once I recommended to him my favorite of 2020, I'm thinking of ending things. And he stopped talking to me for a week. That's a good <laughs> movie. That's, That's an amazing movie. film. <laughs> the The only thing that, that I would say is that I would watch this film with him just only to he to see his reaction. Yeah, because I I think he would have. I think technically, for the cinematography and the aspect mm. ratio, I know we talked about it a little bit. Here's my perfect version of the technical aspects of this movie. Okay. Here's how I, I know I'm not supposed to do this as a critic. Like wish what a better version of the movie. But I think the black and white cinematography could still exist. But then once you get into the modern day aspect, you switch to color to differentiate. Kind of mm -hmm. like what Oppenheimer did, where here's yeah. the subjective view and the objective view. Because that actually really worked, even though it was confusing while you were watching the film. Because at a certain point, they start talking about modern day events. And I just assumed, oh, this is like in the 70s, right? And then they start mentioning like things as recently as 2001 or I think even later. And I'm yeah. like, oh, then, then maybe the black and white cinematography doesn't fit as well for me. Yeah, I, I think it's striking when he goes into full vampire mode in Santiago, in the capital of, of Chile, mo modern day Chile. And it's yeah. weird. It's strange with a black and white. Yeah, maybe that's the point. Yeah, because I it's definitely any time he takes flight, I'm like, oh, this is weird. And you can tell w what they're doing behind the scenes mm -hmm. of how to make him fly. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I was reading the uh, production notes. Mm -hmm. Carmen Sita. Hey, yeah. She was the one in the in the in the flying scenes. Oh, wow. <laughs> According to the production notes, at least. OK. She was like the stunt double. But other than that, technically, wh what did you think of the 2-1 aspect ratio? I liked it, especially because I did my homework. I, I did my research afterwards that he was trying to make an impression as a German impressionist film, like with all those references. And I was like, oh, OK, I get it. And he did an amazing job, especially blending the VFX work into that. I think 
because here's the thing. Technically, it's a wonderful film. Technically. Mm -hmm. Like, the music's great. The aspect ratio worked a lot for me. The music is great, especially in the montages. I just thought the music was overwhelming at times, where I'm just yeah. like, okay, can we just put it, put the violins down a little bit more in the mix so I could actually hear what's going on? No, I get that. I, I, I would just say that it's well made. It's not like it's a bad yeah. film. It's a very well-crafted film. It's just that the rhythm of, of it all and the how they managed or how he managed to give all the information, especially because this is not a film. I, this is what happens to me, and I can relate, because the short film that I did, I have one specific joke that only Peruvians will understand. And that is a problem if I want to, like, make a film for all the world to watch. And I think what he did here, he was like, okay, people will get it. If they don't get it, they need to learn from it. And I'm like, okay, I get that. I respect that. I did that <laughs> with my film, but it's not okay because you need to, you need to know your audience while making the film. Yeah, and being on a streaming service as wide as Netflix, mm -hmm. I don't think, I, I think having such a specific audience, unless you're like Black Mirror or something, yeah, um, it, it the people who click on it are probably done within the first 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah, in the best case scenario, I think, like being Chilean or being Latin American give you a plus of understanding more of the film, but... In this case, it not only gives you a plus, it, it like makes the whole experience different. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know about you, but for if I want to share this film with a lot of cousins that I have in the States or even in Italy, like, they won't get it. They won't get it. And it's rough because it's not a bad film. I would like to share it. it it's certainly interesting. It's better. I don't know what's about film that I've watched this year. Blue Beetle. <laughs> It's better than Blue Beetle or The Flash. I think but... I feel like The Flash is like the little step up thing where it's, oh, that's the hurdle you got. It's just, like, oh, hey, step up and you yeah. pass The Flash. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I, I even think Saw 10 and listeners or watchers or however you're experiencing the podcast, feel free to call me out if this doesn't end up being the case. I think mm -hmm. even Saw 10 will surpass, like, the bar. Oh, the flash? It's not high. <laughs> it's so, not high. It's yeah. I, I would recommend this film just because it's different and just because it's something new. But I know people are going to to ask me, what did I think of it or if I got it completely? Because it, it's new ones, but it's not new ones. I, I always say that it's really impressive when films present you with a subject as difficult as this one but they not only respect the audience saying okay I know you probably don't know about this here's a little summary of it but no this yeah. film like completely does the opposite of that I think like they they do it's weird because they do and they don't because at the beginning as you said the first 30 to 40 minutes it's all about his past it's all about his life. But at least for me, knowing him a little, even though I watch 40 minutes of your life, it's still overwhelming. And I feel like I'm not prepared to watch the second part of the film. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think he should have, Pablo should have mm -hmm. been a, a little bit smarter with that, maybe like a five minute Hey, here are the cliff notes. Okay, n now let's go into the movie. And I want to go back to something you talked about, how this is mm -hmm. specifically uh, something Chile for the Chilean audience, I think, mm -hmm. uh, is I believe what you said. Don't I don't think that's the exact quote. I don't, know, I don't know how many people know this, but I was doing research while party foul watching the movie because I, there was this one actress where I could have swore she played Rory's mom on Gilmore Girls. 
So I was like, okay, <laughs> is that the same actress? But no, it's an entirely Chilean cast. Yeah, except so, for the narrator. Except, yeah, except for the narrator, <laughs> who is British, which I actually did find my note. The note was, I could do without the British narration. Yeah, um, it's awfully weird. Awfully weird. But but yeah, I, I give them massive respect for, or Pablo, massive respect mm-hmm. for at least doing that, because I feel like there's a way where you could just be, where you could just Hollywoodize it, because you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this is going on Netflix. So let me get like Pedro Pascal or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as Augusto Pinochet or someone like that who's maybe more popular. Yeah, Pedro Pascal is part Chilean. Oh, so then maybe you could have, uh, maybe that there is a version of this where Pedro Pascal is. The uh, narrator. I, I would pay for Pedro Pascal to be the narrator. <laughs> I would pay for him to just narrate my life. He took one step <laughs> yeah. and another. But yeah. Uh, you talk about this working for you. I don't think it worked for me. Mm-hmm. I, it really did not work for me. And especially because of that first half. When we're off and we're acting on the premise of the movie where we get these gruesome shots of parts being put in a blender and drinking blood like literally in a glass cup or whatever. I think it soars there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think... You know, I, I think it just didn't work for me. It, it just didn't. Um, maybe that's because I just didn't know either A, what to expect, or B, just didn't know enough Shay, to really get into it. Yeah. Um, but I also just think maybe it's a result of being too experimental. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. I, I always love when people experiment and do a different type of thing than what they're accustomed to doing. Because while this is a sort of biopic, I would put that in air quotes because it's not, it's more of a what if scenario. And it, it just feels like maybe this was a, maybe a bit out of Pablo's wheelhouse for me. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, com- I completely agree. And and I what I was going to say is that there's no excuse like for an audience member to say, I, I didn't like it, but it's my fault because I didn't do the homework. That is not right. People like <clears throat> when you go and see like Harry Potter, you don't have to read the books to understand the film. Like you need to understand the film you're watching. And if you're not getting the film you're watching, it's not your fault because you're dumb. No, it's, it's the film or the film film that everyone can understand and everyone can, like, uh, even if they don't know the subject, even if they don't, if they didn't know that Augusto Pinochet ex- existed, like, they should see the film and understand it and then say, oh, wow, I'm going to learn more from it, like the real person. Yeah, that's always my point when I bring up documentaries i i think we're getting into an era of documentary where we're getting so hyper specific into people mm-hmm. we are like I, I guess i'll watch a documentary about this person that i don't know anything about and the best of those work when it's oh here's who this person is you don't need to know anything going in here's like a kind of master class on who this person is why they're important and their uh legacy Mm-hmm. And I think, like you say, that should apply to every film, especially yeah. ones dealing with historical fi- figures. Even if it's a what if scenario of this, I don't know if dictator was the right word, living 250 years as a vampire. Yeah, and it's a great premise too, but I agree with what you're saying because, for an example, here in Peru, we didn't have Mr. Rogers at all. But or, or his show, I don't remember what his show was. Uh, uh, it was uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, I believe. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We didn't have that here. Uh, but I knew about him because I lived for a few uh, moments in the States. So I knew the idea of him. But when it comes to uh, the film that with Tom Hanks and the documentary, I watched it with my mom, which my mom knew nothing 
nothing about him. Like he didn't exist for her. And first we watched Won't You Be My Neighbor, the documentary, which she adored. Yeah, she adored it. And then we watched, we did a double feature that day. And then we watched A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And she was completely overwhelmed, but she was at the end crying, like saying, I know this person now. I I know him. Mm -hmm. And she didn't need to do the homework. She didn't need to do nothing to understand the film. And that was like in 2019. And a few weeks ago, I watched A a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood again with, with a cousin of mine. And she didn't knew she didn't know him either but she completely got it and then she was like oh i think i'm going to do research about him because of my, i want to show some clips of him to my daughter i was like yeah that's great completely different persons like i was the pinoche and mr rogers oh yeah but... like completely different <laughs> poles of the uh... of existence yeah but that is the result that you're looking like if a person don't know him they at least need to be interested or, or captured by your film. And then if they want to do a research, they can do it, but they it shouldn't be mandatory. F- film, it's this film, you don't need to watch a movie or do homework or something to get it. Yeah, because you mentioned a, a few minutes ago with Roma. Mm-hmm. The audience instinctively knows or at least understands the inference that, oh, this is about the this person's childhood because, mm. oh, this these things line up with what I've seen of his prior work or maybe even you just know about this director mm-hmm. and then you just get it where and you don't really need to do that research and then you can just enjoy the film and then cry at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. and. With this, I, I don't know. I think th- to sum up everything, I respect it more than I liked it. Because yeah. I know how difficult it is to make a film, especially here in Latin America. Even like a director like Pablo Larraín, who is like internationally known, like it is really tough to make a film here in Latin America. I think it's, it's tough everywhere, but... In Latin America, especially, you have these obstacles like to get the money and the financing to do it. It has to be a very specific type of film. And he didn't do that. He did com- the complete opposite. And he did it with all his taste and all his likes, even though he probably was too out of his league to make this work, as you, you previously said. But I respect that. Even though I didn't like it at all, or I understand it at all, I, I'm happy he did it. <laughs> yeah, I'll say I'm definitely appreciative, like you say, that he did it because I think we need those kind of what if movies where it's just like, mm. here's something so off the balls on off off the walls, not off the balls, <laughs> uh, unexpected. <laughs> about someone a historical figure that it doesn't make sense but hey they tried it and i would love for more movies to do this like yeah hey what if uh, i don't know one of the presidents was like dracula or something like that i don't know or renfield was a really good example except for not a historical figure but Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah i just I, i respect it massively I, I, I yeah. respect it more than I liked it. I think that's the best way to describe this movie is like, I, I think I gave it a two out of five on Letterboxd. Oh, and, wow. Okay. And then because two of those are just for the technical elements, the technical <laughs> and I... <laughs> the utter like confidence Pablo had in, yeah. Hey, what if I told a vampire story about Pinochet? Yeah, no, I com- I completely agree. I think on Letterbox at first, I gave it a three a- three and a half stars, and then I watched Sicario, and for me it's a five out of five movie, and then I the El Conde for a three out of five, just for the technical, like 
things that I think work very well and are very well done. And just for the hell of it, probably they did a, a film like this in Peru, like about our last dictator. I would probably recommend it, even though I didn't like it, because it's so different. It's out of all, I, I appreciate it for my fellow Chileans to like it as well. So that's my recommendation. If you want to know more, if you want to support this trend of giving the, our dictators and our, like, I don't know if they did something like this, like I said, with our history of, of my people, I would probably appreciate it even more. I think this is for the Chileans, for Pablo Larraín specifically. If you want to watch it, go for it. I would say the perfect night is to get really drunk, to know a little bit of Chilean history, and to watch the film. Oh, I don't know if drunk is, is the best one, but go and make a happy round or something. Yeah, maybe maybe get high and watch yeah. this movie. Like, because then you'll have the ultimate time because then you won't care about, like, the first 40 minutes being bad. You'll just, like, because by that time, it's that edible or whatever you're taking is going to hit. Yeah. Uh, like the person who I will not name because I'm not a narc. Mm-hmm. Who we I went to an Avatar two press screening, and uh, I heard him say, "I just took an edible in the car before this." <laughs> so, so be like that guy, yeah, and just do that. And I think by the time you get to that hour mark or whenever it really starts going, um, mm-hmm. I think you'll really enjoy it. Because even though I didn't like it, I think I'd still recommend just watching it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same experience for me for Avatar too. Like, I respect it more than I liked it. But yeah, I would I would probably go ahead and and do that. Yeah, and I recommend because, uh, like I say, it's so different. I don't want to keep watching like these flashes of Blue Beetles. Like, oh, now the uh, the Netflix is remaking Spy Kids. Like, I rather I'm, watch. I'm good. Then El Condes, then watch another <laughs> remake of a Spy Kids movie. Can we go on a little tangent about that Spy Kids movie real quick? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> as a Spy Kids, like as somebody who grew up on Spy Kids, I had to stop after three. Because yeah. literally all Spy Kids Armageddon is the vibes of Spy Kids 1, mm-hmm. but the plot of Spy Kids 3D game over. Okay. And I'm just like, if I want to do that, I'll just watch Spy Kids 3D game over. Yeah, it's the like best with the one. Little, with the little paper 3D glasses that you yeah. got in the DVD set. No, I like, I love that movie because I grew up with it. The, the first three ones. And the fourth one, I think I, I didn't even watch it completely. I probably catch it on network television for a minute or two and then I was like what is this shit and then I changed it and now they're remaking it with the guy from Shazam and I'm like yeah you cannot compete with Antonio Banderas or the original Spy Kids I know they're adults now but you couldn't integrate them in some way yeah or do something fun and make them the villains no it's weird And, and I I think the filmography of that director is, is I, I don't know when in time he decided only to do shitty things, but. I'm trying to remember, did he do Alita? He did. That was so weird because you're I, like grew up with him and Spy Kids and then all of a sudden he's like, I'm making this movie about an anime that Jim, James Cameron was going to make. Yeah. And it's like, no, okay, it's weird. Respect, it slaps. Yeah, no, and people I think are respecting him because he directed a, a good episode of The Mandalorian season two. Ooh, that was good too, yeah. Yeah, I, I only say that his original ideas are like out of place. I, like I'd say, I would rather watch 10 El Condes to watch another Spy Kids. That's pretty much my opinion. <laughs> yeah, really. If we gave 
more money to have these weird movies, I would mm-hmm. be all for it because the, I, I know it's out there, but I just really love weird movies. Yeah. Because, and I feel like we don't get a ton of those anymore. I feel like we get occasional weird movies, mm-hmm. but not as much as we used to in, say, the early 2000s, mm-hmm. where it was just, hey, you want money? Here you go. Yeah, especially in in a network so wild, uh, so wide as uh, Netflix. And it's a high-budget film. I, I don't know how much it costs to make it, but it it looks like something expensive. It looks good. It reminded me, and uh, it reminded me a lot of maybe just because of the black and white. It reminded me a lot of the production value behind the lighthouse. Yeah, because even though there's like excessive film grain at some points, I'm like this actually looks really good when it gets yeah. going. Because unlike a lot of Disney movies I watch, when they do the home media transfer contrast is completely out of place yeah um i think i tweeted a few months ago when wakanda forever came to Mm blu-ray and i was like this underwater shot looks completely different to what i saw in theaters in theaters Uh, i was just like dang this i had to go put it on my tv because of how bad the contrast was but but yeah i 10 more El Condes, but not El Conde 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think uh, you stop at 1. Yeah. You stop at 1. Maybe Pablo Lorraine, you make a, a, another what if story. Like, I think we're getting a lot of these what if stories because I think yeah. poor things would classify mm-hmm. in that same kind of genre. It's, yeah. Because for those and Barbie, know, probably as well. Yeah. Because I think poor things is based on. Frankenstein, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. like w- Willem Dafoe is not Willem the friend, but yeah, it, it, I guess it's some kind of twist on that, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that. But 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 yeah, Anne, thank you so much for coming on. It, thank it, you. It was, um, it, it was great to have you on. Um, I hope I hope people like listening to this. Um, I, I yeah, I, me too. <laughs> I tr- I tried to do a structure. Um, but um, chaos reigns, as the uh, as a wise fox once said. Yeah. <laughs> but where can people find you? They can find me on Instagram as at the promising young woman, and they can find me. Yeah, thank you. I love the film. That's, and they can find me on Twitter. I will still call it Twitter. As yeah, Anubis Stuki. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Don't find me anywhere else because I get scared. <laughs> oh, on Letterbox, on Letterbox. What am I on Letterbox? I think I'm a noise is too key as well. Yeah, I'll put it on Twitter, my Letterbox. <laughs> awesome. Thank you again. And for listeners slash watchers, thank you for listening. Uh, I've been your host, Austin Belzer. Uh, if you enjoyed this po- episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app, whatever that may be. Also, uh, if you're on Spotify, Spotify and Patreon have this thing where you can link your Patreon and Spotify accounts together, uh, where you can just subscribe, I, I think, from the Spotify app to my Patreon, and you get all the exclusive audio, a- any audio posts I put on Patreon on Spotify, so that's fun. And as for where you could follow me, you can follow me on social media everywhere at Austin B Media. Everywhere except for Twitter, because somebody stole my Twitter handle. I even disputed it, and Twitter was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm just waiting for one day they release the at Austin B Media handle so I can get it. I check every morning. <laughs> okay, do, do, is it here? Uh, I'm, I'm also on threads. That's mainly where you're going to see me. Yeah, thanks again, and I'll see you probably tomorrow with Elemental, and yeah, Elemental's the next one. Before we exit the show, though, I want to thank my patrons. Specifically, I want to thank Ambula Bula, Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis, whose work you can find on Sith Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, and Tom Blackburn, who gave me the whole idea to do this discussion-style podcast in the first place. 
If you want to become a patron, head on over to patreon.com slash austinbmedia or austinb.media slash support for more information. Until next time.